honored to be introducing Noam Chomsky, uh, who is someone I have uh, respected and admired for a long, long time. And it's interesting that whenever people who were once on the left are about to move to the right, which happens, <laughs> the first test for the, uh, to know what they're about to do is when they try to reassure the people they work for or their colleagues by saying, I'm not part of the Chomsky left. <coughs> <laughs> Whenever anyone says that, beware, <laughs> because they could end up anywhere, <laughs> and some of them have <laughs> ended up supporting George W. Bush. Many people who initially started off by saying, I'm not part of the Chomsky left. <laughs> so that's always a good test. Now, it's difficult to talk about Noam because his work is so well known all over the world. And he wears so many hats and speaks in so many different places that it's not easy to put him in a box and say this is a, what he is and that's all. But let me try. When I was thinking who Noam reminded me of the most as a public intellectual, the name that came to mind was someone very different from Noam in many ways, but quite similar in others, and that was the late British philosopher Bertrand Russell. And Bertrand Russell, at an early stage in his life, became a conscientious objector, refused to fight in the First World War. Unlike Noam, he came from a very prominent aristocratic family in Britain, you know, one of the oldest aristocratic families in Britain, the Dukes of Bedford. Uh, and when Burton Russell became very radical and said we have to have a war crimes tribunal to judge the United States for war crimes in Vietnam, we couldn't find a single hotel in London which was prepared to give us room. And we said to uh, Russell, we said, what are we going to do? And he said, oh, this is the first time I've regretted having given up all my inheritance. <laughs> So we said, but we've got to do, he said, I will make a few phone calls. And the first meeting of the International War Crimes Tribunal on Vietnam was held in the Hotel Russell in Bedford Square, <laughs> property that had been owned by Russell's family and which he'd given away. I mean, he said he didn't want to be part of it. Now, the important thing about Russell, like Noam, was that he was not fearful of speaking his mind and speaking the truth to heads of state, to heads of governments. I remember once I met him just after some particular atrocity in Vietnam, and Russell had been at some ceremony where the British Prime Minister had come forward to greet him and said, hello, Lord Russell, and Russell said, I could not bear the thought of shaking this man's hand because he backed the war in Vietnam. So he turned his back on him and walked away. And there are people like that around. And Noam Chomsky is one of the few. And this is the voice of America, which we have to defend and promote all over the world. Because if there weren't people, weren't dissidents like Chomsky, it would be very difficult to defend the United States and explain to people that there is an opposition that not everyone in the United States follows the government, and that often there is a large opposition which is not reflected in the press. And this is what being a public intellectual is all about. And recently there have been a spate of essays and some books, bad books, bad essays, published in bad newspapers, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> which have talked about public intellectuals, and then when you read them, they come up with figures like Thomas Friedman and uh, uh, Michael Ignatieff and Christopher Hitchens and, <laughs> and uh, various other jokers. Uh, 
Now, the point is, for me, there are two types of intellectuals. There are these people I've mentioned and others. We could name quite a few. Uh, these, in my opinion, are state intellectuals. They're not public intellectuals. They don't speak in the public interest. They're state intellectuals. They defend the state. They speak on its behalf. They carry on writing uh, in defense of its lies and its atrocities and its crimes as if it was simple. People who all supported the war on Iraq do not care a damn that 100,000 Iraqis have been killed. 100,000 Iraqis. And all these state intellectuals who defend the war in Iraq never speak about this figure because that doesn't bother them. Well, Chomsky does. And he is meticulous in the way he searches the facts, analyzes them, and presents them. And it is to his enormous credit that he does this in a country whose political culture has totally isolated him. I mean, let's, I, things are not that good in Europe either. I don't want to exaggerate. But if Chomsky was living in France or Britain, he would have a column fairly regularly in any major newspaper in Germany, France, Britain, or Italy. There's no question about it, because things have not got that bad there as yet. <laughs> they may. But in the United States, this is impossible. It's impossible. And this, despite this, his voice is heard all over the world, despite the fact that he is treated as a pariah in his own country by the mainstream establishment as well as by the liberal establishment to a large extent. But despite the fact this is the one American voice which is respected in Iraq, which is respected by ordinary people in Pakistan, which is respected in virtually the whole continent of Latin America. Why? Because everyone knows that in order to win, you need the support of the American people. You need the support of American citizens, ordinary people. And Noam Chomsky is the one person who gives a voice to many of these people who can never be heard either on the American media or outside. And that makes him extremely important. And that makes him a very precious asset for dissidents and for resistance movements all over the world. And now he's been doing this for a long, long time, nearly 45 years. And this voice has become stronger and stronger and stronger. And the fact that the enemies, his enemies and our enemies in many cases, cannot deal with this forces them to resort to slanders, to lies, because they can't deal with his arguments, even though he's not on television. He's not published regularly anywhere in the mainstream press. His books circulate all over the world, and his voice cannot be drowned. And even this single voice, dominant, powerful, truthful, they don't like. They don't like it. They attack him. People who have endless reams of space in the New York Times and the Washington Post, they can say what they want. They feel obliged to attack him. And it's interesting, this, because they could ignore him if they wished, but they can't. And the reason they can't is because Chomsky's voice has become the conscience of his country, and is heard all over the world. And that is the reason why he can't be ignored. I first read texts by Noam 40 years ago at the time of the Vietnam War. And <clears throat> he influenced me. And he influenced many generations. It's the third generation now which he's influencing. And it's wonderful to see him in different parts of the world, especially when he's speaking to young people, a new generation. And you feel when he speaks in his own characteristic fashion, as you will hear soon, when he speaks you and, and the young listen avidly to him, you feel that a 
he is passing on the baton of descent to a new generation. And that is an extremely important task today because we live in a turbulent, unpleasant world. We live in a world where this country has become too powerful and too militarily dominant for its own good. And we need more and more dissenting voices. So my slogan... <laughs> so, So I think our slogan has to be, create two, three, many Chomskys. <laughs> I'm very proud to welcome Noam Chomsky on behalf of the Lennon Foundation here today. Thank you more eloquently if I could see you, but it's all black, so uh, I assume there are people there. Uh, my uh, last visit to uh, New Mexico was uh, five years ago for the, uh, to join in the celebration of the 20th anniversary of IRC. I'm very pleased to be able to participate in the uh, 25th anniversary celebration. Uh, since that time, uh, as you know, the name has changed, the scope has broadened, uh, but the mission remains. Uh, the central component, as they put it, is to make the United States a more responsible global partner and to engage uh, citizens in that endeavor. Well, that task was uh, urgent enough five years ago. Uh, even at that time, there were warnings from right at the part of the establishment that I'm quoting, uh, much of the world regards the United States as a rogue state and the greatest threat to their existence. Uh, that happens to be Samuel Huntington, Harvard professor at, uh, uh, in Foreign Affairs, the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations. And he was not alone. Shortly after the president of the American Political Science Association uh, repeated the same message in very similar words. That was five years ago. Uh, since then, the situation has become far worse. Uh, it's now not much of the world that regards the US as a rogue state and the greatest threat to their existence, but uh, most of the world, almost all of it, in fact. Uh, George Bush, has uh, his administration, has succeeded in a few years in making the United States the most feared and often hated uh, country in the world. Well, one reason for this, obvious, is the invasion of Iraq, uh, which uh, against extraordinary international opposition, in fact, I can't think of a historical parallel to that. Uh, that in incidentally includes the so-called coalition of the willing. Uh, so uh, at the summit uh, meeting announcing uh, the war, declaring the war virtually, uh, uh, George Bush and his, uh, I'll say politely, associate Tony Blair were joined by Prime Minister Aznar of Spain uh, to announce that the war was going to start in a couple of days. At that point, Aznar had uh, support of 2% of the population of Spain for joining in the U.S.-British war. Uh, and uh, he was therefore uh, hailed as a great leader of uh, what was called the uh, New Europe, the grand hope for democracy. Uh, in fact, the uh, performance uh, about uh, New Europe and Old Europe was a very enlightening one. Uh, there was a very sharp cry, you remember it, of course. Uh, uh, New Europe were the good guys, the hope of the future, the leaders of... Uh, uh, the democratic uh, crusade and so on. Old Europe were the bad guys, stuck in their old ways, don't, don't have democratic credentials. Uh, the criterion to distinguish them was extremely sharp. Uh, 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 old Europe, bad guys. 
uh, were the countries where the governments took the same position as the large majority of their population. Uh, <laughs> New Europe uh, were the countries like Spain, uh, where the uh, government overruled even larger majorities of their population, huge ones in the case of Spain and Italy, uh, and uh, followed orders from Crawford, Texas. Uh, so they were, therefore, they understood the nature of democracy. Perhaps the most extraordinary case was Turkey, uh, which to everyone's surprise, mine too, uh, the government uh, actually followed the, took the same position as 95% of the population uh, and rejected Washington's orders. And they were bitterly condemned uh, by the U.S. leadership, by intellectuals. Uh, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, who's identified by the Washington Post as the what they call the idealist in chief uh, leading the democracy crusade, uh, he went so far as to berate the Turkish military uh, because they didn't uh, force the government to overrule 95% of the population and uh, take their marching orders from the boss. And he uh, ordered them to apologize to the United States for this and uh, uh, to uh, make it clear that their task is to help America. Well, that performance was doubly interesting. At first, because it took place, and second, because nobody seemed to notice it and what it meant uh, and what it means about the elite conceptions of uh, democracy uh, shouldn't require any comment. Uh, what it means is democracy is fine as long as you do what we say. And we, of course, doesn't mean you and me or the people of the United States. It means the political and economic leadership. And that conception is so deeply ingrained uh, that even in an incredible case like this, it literally can't be noticed. Well, uh, one reason for the... Uh, 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 the uh, uh, deterioration in the position of the United States in the eyes of the world uh, is, of course, the invasion of Iraq. For most of the world, uh, that was uh, the supreme international crime uh, encompassing uh, all the evil that follows. The wording of the Nuremberg judgment, trying the Nazi criminals, including people like the Nazi foreign minister, von Ribbentrop, uh, who was accused and hanged, in fact, uh, for such crimes as, uh, f as uh, 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 preparing the diplomatic background for uh, Hitler's uh, preemptive strike against Norway, uh, which uh, I'll leave the consequences of the conclusion from that uh, to you. Uh, the evil that followed uh, uh, in, uh, was uh, only... Uh, uh, increase the fear and the hatred. Uh, that's, first of all, the fate of Iraqis, as Tariq mentioned, uh, the most probable estimate of deaths uh, done in a careful study several months ago. was about 100,000 mostly violent deaths since the U.S. invasion. Uh, the uh, number of uh, children suffering from acute mal malnutrition has doubled. Uh, it's now at the level of uh, Burundi, uh, lower than uh, uh, Haiti and uh, Uganda. Uh, these matters were barely reported uh, in the United States and insofar as they were even mentioned, quickly dismissed. In England, there was enough uh, of a response so that the British government had to uh, uh, release a, a pathetic and uh, embarrassing answer. Uh, here, not even that. And that's uh, a rather important fact that has to be borne in mind uh, for people here who care about their country. Uh, the, uh, uh, follow that, that's just the beginning of it. Uh, what followed were really serious, outright war crimes. Uh, we've just seen one the last few months, the invasion of Fallujah. And in this case, the crimes were not concealed, uh, which may be worse than passing them over in silence. So they were openly reported and, in fact, proudly reported. Uh, you could uh, see on the front page of the New York Times a big picture of uh, the first victory in the conquest of Fallujah. The first target was the Fallujah General Hospital. And the Times featured a big picture on the front page of a soldier uh, standing guard over people lying on the floor 
in hospital gowns with their hands uh, tied behind their backs. And the story explained that uh, the American forces that went in forced the patients from their, bed, from their beds, uh, forced them to lie on the floor, and manacled them with their hi uh, hands behind their backs. Uh, the story went on to say that this had to be done because the Fallujah General Hospital uh, was serving as a propaganda weapon for the insurgents uh, by releasing uh, casualty figures. Uh, and the Times added, of course, that these are inflated casualty figures. They knew they were inflated because our dear leader had announced that, which is apparently enough. Uh, the foundation of uh, contemporary modern post-Second World War humanitarian law, and in fact part of the supreme law of the land in the United States, uh, is the Geneva Conventions. Uh, the conventions explicitly and unambiguously state that any medical facility must be protected uh, by any combatants in any conflict. Uh, anything other than that is a major war crime, grave breach of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, under the uh, under U current U.S. law, the War Crimes Act of 1996, passed by Republican Congress, uh, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions uh, carry a uh, sentence, a, a, a possible death penalty. Uh, maybe our coming Attorney General had that kind of thing in mind a couple of years ago when he was legal counsel to President Bush and advised him in that capacity uh, that he should uh, rescind the, effectively rescind the Geneva Conventions to reduce the likelihood of prosecution. Well, again, you can draw the conclusions yourselves. Uh, all of this was passed over very lightly here, mostly without comment, uh, but not elsewhere. Uh, the evil that followed the invasion and is encompassed in the supreme international crime uh, didn't only include Iraq, there are consequences for the rest of the world too, including Americans. Uh, one of the consequences is uh, an increase in uh, terrorism, the kind of terrorism that passes through our doctrinal filters, namely terrorism by others against us, the other kind is not recognized. Uh, but that category of terrorism, uh, as anticipated, increased uh, before the invasion uh, there were warnings uh, from uh, uh, specialists, uh, people knowledgeable about the area. Tariq was one of the early ones. Uh, uh, in fact, the, even the uh, U.S. and British intelligence agencies, uh, that the invasion of Iraq would be likely to increase uh, the threat of terrorism. And in fact, uh, the, those warnings were realized. It, they, it did increase the threat. Uh, the uh, national intelligence estimate uh, in the United States that was presented to George Bush a month before the invasion, released recently, uh, warned uh, that the invasion would very likely increase the threat of terrorism. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the National Intelligence Council, it's the coordinating body of intelligence agencies, uh, released its projections for the next 15 years. And one of them is that uh, Iraq uh, will now become uh, a train is becoming and will continue to be a training ground for uh, jihadi terrorists, Islamic terrorists, uh, much in the way that Afghanistan was in the past. They didn't go on to say when Afghanistan was a training ground for terrorists, so let's add that. Uh, it was in the primarily, at first in the 1980s, when the CIA and its associates, uh, pretty much the present administration or their mentors, uh, organized. Uh, radical Islamist uh, terrorists from around the world for their own state purposes, uh, created the foundation of what is now called Al-Qaeda and other related organizations. Uh, and then again, uh, Afghanistan became a major training ground for terrorists uh, after uh, Clinton bombed the Sudan and Afghanistan in 1998. Uh, uh, that uh, led to uh, uh, warmer, much closer relations between Osama bin Laden and the Taliban, previously cool, uh, and uh, turned Afghanistan into a training ground for terrorists again. Uh, now uh, Iraq is uh, taking its place. Well, these are, this carries uh, consequences for uh, everyone uh, and very threatening ones. Uh, sooner or later, uh, terrorism and weapons of mass destruction are going to be united 
and the consequences could be pretty awful. Uh, there are uh, other sources of global concern and fear and anger uh, with regard to the United States, uh, which were evident even before the Iraq invasion. Uh, primarily, the stance of uh, brazen contempt uh, for the entire framework of uh, international order that has been laboriously constructed since World War II and is simply dismissed uh, with contempt by the administration. Just to take one of many examples related to terror, the National Intelligence Council report that I just mentioned uh, predicts that uh, one of the a major threat to the United States will be uh, biological weapons. Uh, now that threat can be reduced, and we know how to reduce it. There is a bioweapons treaty, but it has no enforcement mechanisms, and there have been negotiations go been going on for several years to add enforcement measures to the uh, bioweapons treaty, which would certainly have the effect of uh, monitoring, controlling, and reducing the threat of biological terror that the National Intelligence Council warned against. However, that's not going to happen. Uh, in September of 2002, uh, right after the Bush administration released its national security strategy, which sent plenty of shivers around the world, uh, a couple of days later, its uh, uh, point man, John Bolton, informed Europe that there would be no further negotiations uh, to introduce enforcement measures into the bioweapons treaty. Now, the reasons that were given was that inspection, uh, of course that would involve inspection, and inspection uh, might harm the interests of uh, U.S. pharmaceutical corporations. Uh, there are also suspicions uh, that Washington wants to conceal illegal bioweapons research and development that it's carrying, uh, it's carrying out. Uh, so therefore, uh, the National Intelligence Council is quite right to uh, warn of the increasing threat of uh, biological warfare terror here. Uh, however, there are much worse threats than biological weapons, uh, far worse. Uh, nuclear weapons and militarization of space are surely the most serious threats. Uh, all of this is particu of particular significance in New Mexico uh, because New Mexico is, as I'm sure you know, one of the major centers uh, in enhancing these threats to survival. And in this case, we are literally talking about survival of the species. Well, these threats uh, are leading to much more dire warnings than those that I quoted, uh, again, from the heart of the establishment. So last summer, the uh, Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is very sober and uh, respectable and not given to hyperbole, uh, ran an article by two prominent uh, uh, strategic analysts, John Steinbrenner and Nancy Gallagher, in which they pointed out, these are mostly quotes, that the military programs and aggressive stance of the administration carry, in their words, appreciable risk of ultimate doom. Uh, and they go on to say that you have to look very hard. In fact, I can't think of a case where such words have ever been pronounced in establishment, respectable establishment circles. They go on to say that if the United States is to remain a democracy worthy of the name, the political system will have to acknowledge that the United States is now the dominant threat to everyone else. The, their words, the super outlaw state. Uh, they go on to explain that the terrifying technology that is being developed in Donald Rumsfeld's transformation of the military will assuredly diffuse to the rest of the world. There will be a competition in intimidation, an action-reaction cycle, creating rising dangers, potentially unmanageable ones for Americans as well. And in fact, that's already been happening. Uh, the, uh, uh, Russia, a year ago, uh, had its uh, first military, serious military exercises in 20 years. Uh, they deployed uh, new offensive weapons, uh, more sophisticated missiles, uh, nuclear armed, aimed at the United States. Uh, U.S. military analysts estimate that uh, Russia may have tripled its military expenditures since the Bush administration came in with its militaristic stance. 
uh, they have officially adopted the Bush administration's uh, so-called preemptive war strategy, meaning uh, uh, asserting the right of a first strike, even a first nuclear strike, uh, without, uh, uh, without a pretext of defense. Uh, Washington's uh, aggressive stance is compelling the Russians, uh, who are much weaker, of course, to transfer uh, missiles uh, thousands of miles from one part of their territory border to another uh, repeatedly. Uh, this is over very lightly defended areas. Nuclear armed missiles, very tempting target for terrorists. Uh, their uh, nu uh, offensive nuclear system has been placed on hair trigger alert, computer controlled firing. Uh, we know about how the U.S. systems work. Lots known about that. Uh, our systems are also computer controlled, uh, and there are regular occurrences, frequent occurrences, of the computer systems giving a warning that a missile that the U.S. is under attack and must respond. Uh, the rules are that uh, when such a warning comes, and it is very frequent, uh, there are three minutes for human intervention to determine whether it's an authentic attack, and then uh, there's a time for presidential authorization, uh, 30 seconds. That's the way our systems work. Uh, the Russian systems are far worse, uh, furthermore deteriorating. Uh, the threat is being very uh, consciously en enhanced, and it's a very serious one. The senator, former Senator Sam Nunn, who was one of the leading figures in arms control, uh, wrote a couple of weeks ago that it is madness for human survival to depend on the hope that regular computer errors will be caught in time. Uh, the threat is severe and, he says, may well be increasing. Well, we know that there have been very close calls in the past. Uh, the most dangerous was discovered in October 2002 uh, on the 40th anniversary of the missile crisis. It, there was a conference of, in Havana of high-level uh, participants, those who are still alive in the original missile crisis from uh, the United States, Cuba, and Russia. And uh, they, they had already known that the missile crisis was, as Arthur Schlesinger put it, Kennedy, memoirist and advisor, uh, was the most dangerous moment in history. But they were shocked at what was learned at this 40th anniversary meeting. It turned out that the world was literally one word away from nuclear war. The details, if you like. Uh, two of the uh, leading scholars of the missile crisis who helped organize that meeting, James Blight and Phil Brenner, commented that uh, it is miraculous that the world escaped the nuclear war on that occasion. And it had unusual contemporary relevance in another respect. The missile crisis was in large part a consequence of a major international terrorist campaign. Uh, John F. Kennedy's Operation Mongoose, uh, the goal of which was uh, to bring the terrors of the earth to Cuba. Now, those are the, that's, again, Arthur Schlesinger's words in his uh, biography of Robert Kennedy, describing Kennedy, Robert Kennedy's uh, goal. He was in charge of these operations, uh, which he made the highest priority for U.S. intelligence agencies. It led pretty directly to the missile crisis and to the miraculous escape. Well, uh, this was the most important news in many years. Uh, it was barely reported, literally, uh, it, uh, and all ignored. Uh, few people even know about it, uh, which raises further questions about the viability of uh, American democracy and reasons why the world should be frightened. We should be, too. Uh, without saying so explicitly, the two strategic analysts I mentioned, uh, Steinbrenner and Gallagher, express a very deep despair about American democracy. Uh, after outlining the policies that they say carry an appreciable risk of ultimate doom, they express hope that the policies will be changed, but not from within the United States. Apparently, they don't consider that an option. Uh, they hope that the policies that uh, there will be a coalition of peace-loving states uh, which will counter American militarism, militarism and aggressiveness, uh, which they hope will be led by China. Uh, we've come to a pretty pass 
uh, when leading analysts in the most respectable journals hope that China can save us from the collapse of American democracy. Uh, what that uh, implies about ourselves is pretty shocking. Uh, why did they pick China? Well, explain. Uh, first reason is that China has been in the forefront of international efforts at the United Nations to preserve space for peaceful purposes. Uh, that has been blocked unilaterally by Washington actually since the Clinton years. Uh, not reported, incidentally, though of extreme importance. Uh, it became much worse since Bush took over uh, right after the national security strategy was announced, which essentially declared the U.S. intention to dominate the world by force and prevent any threat to that dominance. Right after that, part of the implementation of it was a, uh, a program announced by the uh, Air Force Space Command uh, shifting policy from Clinton's to a new policy. Clinton's policy was control of space for military purposes. The new announced policy was ownership of space for military purposes, uh, meaning, as they said, inst the possibility of instant engagement anywhere uh, with highly lethal offensive weapons which can strike anywhere on Earth without warning. The whole world is under surveillance by sophisticated uh, 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 satellite and other uh, systems, sophisticated enough so they can tell if a truck is crossing a street in Damascus or any other place you pick. Uh, so the world is at, ins at risk of uh, instant destruction. Uh, that's ownership of space, and that's a natural spelling out of the national security strategy. This also was, as far as I know, not reported at all, certainly not much. Uh, the, uh, a lot of this is uh, called missile defense, uh, but as everyone knows on every side, uh, missile defense is not a defensive system. It's a, it's a first strike weapon. That's understood by U.S. analysts, understood by the Chinese and other potential targets. Uh, and uh, we know how the U.S. reacted when uh, Russia uh, uh, installed a very small missile defense system around Moscow back in 1968. Uh, the U.S., it's been declassified, immediately reacted by sharply increasing its offensive nuclear military force so as to overwhelm it and to destroy all radar positions and so on. And there's very little doubt that uh, potential targets will react to our so-called missile defense system in the same way. It's apparently being deployed in early stages right now. Now, there's a lot of debate and discussion about the so-called missile defense, uh, a lot of criticism on grounds that it uh, hasn't been tried and probably won't work and so on. Now, that may be true or may not be true, but it's kind of missing the point. Uh, the system is far more dangerous if there's some appearance that it might work. Uh, that's, going, that's what's going to impel potential targets to do exactly what the United States did in the case of a much more primitive and insignificant missile defense system in 1968, namely to expand their offensive military capacities to overwhelm it. Uh, so the real danger is that it might look as though it's going to work. Well, that brings us to the second reason why Steinbrenner and Gallagher hope that China will uh, lead a coalition to counter U.S. aggressiveness. Uh, the reason, as they say, is that of all the nuclear states, China has been the most restrained in the uh, development and deployment of nuclear weapons. In fact, it's done very little. However, that's changing. Uh, now, China, too, is reacting uh, to Rumsfeld's uh, transformation of the military, just as the Russians have done. Uh, they've recently announced sharp increases in development and deployment of uh, offensive military weapons, advanced missiles, uh, uh, nuclear weapons, and so on contributing to the action-reaction cycle. Uh, all of this is vastly more dangerous than Iran's alleged programs, even if you assume that all the charges are true. And that's happening right here. In fact, right here in New Mexico and not being reported. Well, these few examples, which are really a scattered sample, uh, should be enough to show that there's quite a long way to go in fulfilling the uh, IRC mission of making the United States a more responsible global partner. 
uh, and should be enough to indicate that uh, despair about the state of American democracy is so extreme among serious, respected analysts in mainstream circles that they actually express the hope that outsiders led by China can somehow rescue the world from the failed political system in the United States, uh, which has turned the United States into an outlaw state, uh, in their words again, the dominant threat to everyone else. Well, the election of last November uh, strongly reinforced that feeling in much of the world. It also led to a good deal of uh, despair and sometimes hopelessness among Americans, at least those who are concerned about the fate of their country and the world, and the concerns are very real. Uh, they include the likelihood of uh, terminal war, terminal nuclear war, uh, environmental catastrophe, uh, the enhanced threat of terror, uh, plenty of domestic concerns, uh, the uh, uh, very dedicated effort to dismantle the achievements of the past popular struggle in the past century, and now being systematically dismantled uh, in uh, an exercise of fraud uh, that is truly uh, awesome. Uh, the con game about Social Security is a, a, a pretty striking, stunning even example of uh, sheer uh, audacity and contempt for the population and faith in the enormous power of public relations as an instrument of deceit run through the details, I assume you know them, but it is pretty stunning. Well, that faith in public relations as an instrument of deceit uh, may well be warranted. Uh, after a few weeks of intense propaganda, a fair, a large part of the population, particularly, particularly young people, uh, have come to believe that the social security system is in fact in crisis, which is too ridiculous to discuss. Uh, the war in Iran was, uh, in Iraq, uh, was sold in the same way. In September 2002, and that is a month that will go down in history if history continues, uh, in that month there was a huge propaganda campaign uh, initiated by our next Secretary of State who warned about that the next thing we'll hear from Saddam Hussein is a mushroom cloud over New York. Uh, within a couple of weeks of government media propaganda, uh, the American population was simply driven entirely off the spectrum of world opinion, uh, fearing Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, ties to Al-Qaeda, probably involvement in 9-11, and so on. Uh, Saddam Hussein was hated almost everywhere, uh, certainly in the countries that uh, he had invaded, Kuwait and Iran, but he was feared only in the United States, not in those countries. Uh, and that, incidentally, remains true. Uh, some striking recent statistics on that. Uh, right now, it turns out that about 75% of the American population think the United States should not have gone to war uh, if Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction and ties to uh, Al-Qaeda. Well, the belief, nevertheless, roughly 50% think the U.S. should have gone to war. Uh, even after the government's own report, the Kay and Dilfer report, have completely exploded those charges. Well, there's actually no contradiction there. People still believe it, uh, despite the refutation. Roughly half the population still believes uh, that, yes, uh, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction or programs to develop them and ties to al-Qaeda terrorism. And it's not surprising that they do, if you read the report of yesterday's committee hearings on uh, uh, the uh, Rice nomination. The Senate Majority Leader, Bill Frist, gave a statement justifying the war, and he said, uh, outlaw regimes must be confronted, nuclear weapons proliferation must be stopped, uh, terrorist organizations must be destroyed. Therefore, we were right to invade Iraq. It didn't matter that we known beyond dispute that they had no, they weren't involved in nuclear weapons proliferation and that they had no ties to terror, though now they're a terrorist haven. As for confronting outlaw regimes, a uh, few thoughts come to mind, but uh, <laughs> I'll leave it there. Uh, the uh, faith in the power of deceit is shared uh, uh, in the places that matter, 
uh, in policymaking centers, in particular in the business world. Uh, we all know this. Uh, corporations spend hundreds of billions of dollars a year in uh, advertising, uh, which is not an effort to inform, but it's an effort to deceive, as we all know. Uh, if you want to find out the characteristics of, uh, say, uh, the cars that uh, Ford is going to produce next year or of uh, drugs or other commodities, you don't turn on the television set to see ads. Uh, the goal of the ads, as hundreds of billions of dollars, is to uh, uh, project imagery, first of all, to create artificial wants, and secondly, to delude you into satisfying those created wants uh, with one commodity rather than another uh, more or less identical one. The uh, commitment to deceive is pursued with real fanaticism. Uh, that's demonstrated not only by the scale, literally hundreds of billions a year, uh, but uh, also in other ways. So recently, though it wasn't reported here, there were uh, uh, negotiations with Australia to establish uh, what's called a free trade agreement. It's nothing to do with free trade and certainly not an agreement, but that's what those things are called. Uh, it's, uh, a, a, but, and the, the negotiations were held up for some time uh, because the United States was objecting to Australia's highly efficient uh, health care system, maybe the most efficient in the world. The prices of drugs are a fraction of what they are in the United States. Same, very same drug produced by the same corporation, which makes a ton of money in Australia, but makes maybe 10 times that much for the same uh, drug here. But why was the U.S. objecting to the Australian system? Well, because the Australian system is evidence-based. That's the phrase that was used. That means if uh, you know, a pharmaceutical corporation wants to advertise uh, uh, you know, by showing a sports hero saying, you know, this drug is, ask your doctor if this drug is good for you, it's good for me, or something like that, often not even telling you what it is, uh, they're not allowed to do that. Uh, they have to provide evidence that the drug actually does something, uh, that it's better than some cheaper thing that's already on the market. And that evidence-based approach, uh, the U.S. negotiators argued, is uh, interference with free markets. Uh, because corporations must have the right to deceive. Uh, that's crucial. Uh, Australia sort of uh, backed off on that. Uh, but the claim itself is kind of amusing. I mean, even if you believe the free market rhetoric for a moment, uh, the main purpose of advertising is to undermine markets. Uh, if you go to graduate school and you take a course in economics, uh, you, learn that, uh, you learn that markets are systems in which uh, informed consumers make rational choices. That's what's so wonderful about them. Uh, but that's the last thing that the state corporate system wants. Uh, it is spending huge sums to prevent that, uh, which brings us back to the viability of American democracy. Uh, for many years, uh, elections here, election campaigns, have been run by the public relations industry and each time it's with increasing sophistication. And quite naturally, the industry uses the same technique to sell candidates that it uses to sell toothpaste or lifestyle drugs. Uh, the point is to undermine markets by projecting imagery to delude and suppressing information, and similarly to undermine democracy by same method, projecting imagery to delude and suppressing information. The uh, candidates are uh, trained, carefully trained, uh, to uh, project a certain image. Uh, intellectuals like to make fun of George Bush's uh, you know, use of phrases like uh, misunderestimate and so on, but my strong suspicion is that he's trained to do that. He's carefully trained to efface the fact that he's a spoiled frat boy from Yale and to look like a Texas roughneck, kind of ordinary guy just like you, who just waiting to get back to the ranch that they created for him to you know, throw a cow over his shoulder or whatever you're supposed to do on a ranch. Uh, but, uh, and uh, the, uh, all of this is careful training, ordinary guy. Uh, meanwhile, Kerry is trained to be a goose hunter and a motorcycle uh, rider and so on and so forth. Uh, 
the other imagery seemed to work marginally better. Uh, but the important thing to do is to keep people from knowing the stands and positions of the candidates on any issue or the parties. And it sort of works. Take a look at the last election. Uh, the, right before the election, people were asked, voter, p potential voters were asked on what, what, what are the grounds for your vote going to be. Uh, about 10 percent said they were voting uh, on the basis of the, of the candidate stands on issues, agendas, policies, and ideas. Six percent for Bush voters, 13 percent for Kerry voters. Uh, the rest are voting for what are called qualities or values in the PR industry, which is, of course, all meaningless. Uh, there is a measure used by political scientists called issue awareness. Uh, to what extent are voters uh, aware of the stand of the candidates they're voting for on issues? Well, that hit an all-time low in the year 2000, lowest recorded. Uh, this election, 2004, it was even worse. You can't measure it uh, because the voters tended to assume that the candidates shared their opinions, even when the party platforms explicitly rejected them. Uh, the suppression of information was so effective and the projection of image, imagery so overwhelming that, candidate, that the voters literally uh, just took for granted, well, I don't know what these guys stand for, but probably for whatever I want. Uh, that was extreme for Bush, uh, but it was also true for Kerry unless you give a very sympathetic interpretation uh, to vague statements now and then that most voters never even heard. Uh, the uh, uh, imagery for Bush, he was supposed to project an image as an ordinary guy just like you, also a strong leader, going to protect you against terror and so on. In fact, the major component of the Bush vote was people who were concerned about terror. Uh, actually, the Bush administration had acted consciously uh, to increase the threat of terror. Uh, the invasion of Iraq is a striking example of it. Um, not because they want terror, but because it just doesn't matter very much. It's not a high priority. It's just like the risk of nuclear destruction. They don't want it. It's not a high priority. Uh, there are many uh, other examples of that, some of them pretty striking. Uh, so a couple of m the Treasury Department has a bureau uh, called... Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC, which uh, monitors suspicious financial transfers around the world. Well, it's obviously a core element of the so-called war on terror. Uh, every year they report to Congress what their activities are. They reported last spring uh, that uh, uh, they have, uh, OFAC has um, employees who are tracking the uh, suspicious financial transfers that might be related to Al-Qaeda or Saddam Hussein. Four. Four people on their staff are doing that. Five times that many are investigating suspicious transfers that might be an effort to undermine the U.S. embargo against Cuba, which has been declared illegal by every relevant international forum, but is fi it's five times as important uh, to make sure that we can strangle Cuba than it is to uh, monitor uh, transfers of al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. Well, that didn't get reported either, but it again tells you what the priorities are, uh, and there are many more examples. Uh, also, Bush was supposed to be stand up for your values. That's something that was projected. Uh, what are the values? Well, those are pretty easy to determine. Uh, all you have to do is read the business press the day after the election, uh, it was describing uh, euphoria uh, in boardrooms uh, in New York and, uh, 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 and around the country. Uh, why euphoria in boardrooms? Well, certainly not because uh, CEOs are uh, opposed to gay marriage. In fact, their attitudes are what are called liberal. Uh, but those are the values that are uh, the real ones. Uh, we also learn the values of the administration by observing their uh, uh, fierce uh, dedication to transferring costs to the next generation, and serious costs, uh, environmental costs, uh, fiscal costs, even the cost of ultimate doom. Uh, let's turn to the Kerry voters. The major, uh, uh, strongest support for Kerry came from people who were concerned about uh, things like health care. Well, what was Kerry's health care program? Actually, 
very few people know. It's hard to find out. Certainly never stated in any understandable way. Uh, the New York Times, uh, after the last debate, two or three days before the election, uh, the New York Times commented on the debate. It was supposed to be about domestic issues. That Kerry didn't bring up any, didn't make any hint about possible government involvement in uh, health care programs because that position has, in their words, no political support. Well, according to the most recent polls, about 80% of the population think that the government ought to guarantee health care for everyone and furthermore regard it as a moral obligation. It tells you something about people's values, but there's no political support. Uh, why? Well, because the pharmaceutical industry is opposed, the uh, financial institutions are opposed, the insurance industry opposed, so there's no political support. It doesn't matter if 80% uh, of the population regard it as a moral obligation. That doesn't count as political support, which again tells you something about the elite conception of democracy. Well, the importance of avoiding issues, as was done very successfully in the election, the importance of that was brought out very clearly right before the election. Uh, the U.S. had a very uh, opinion in the United States and attitudes is very carefully monitored and controlled. We know a lot about it. Uh, two of the most respected institutions that monitor public attitudes uh, released major studies time for the election. They came out in September, uh, right before it. And the results were extremely interesting uh, and surprising. Turns out that a large majority of the population thinks the United States ought to join the International Criminal Court. It ought to subject itself to judgments of the uh, World Court. It ought to join the Kyoto Treaty. Uh, it ought to, that the UN, not the United States, ought to take the lead in international crises, including use of force. Uh, in fact, a majority of the population uh, even believe that the United States ought to give up the veto at the Security Council and follow the position of the majority, even if it doesn't like the, that. Uh, with regard to the use of force in international affairs, uh, the, popula the general population takes a, a, gives, a, a, a keeps to what, a rather conservative interpretation of international law, of the UN Charter, that the use of force is legitimate if you're under attack, of course, in self-defense, or if there is an imminent threat of attack. So there's nothing to do except re resort to force. That's a very large percentage of the population. Uh, notice that both political parties reject everything I just said. They reject it so much that it's not even discussed. So the bipartisan consensus and the media completely reject the position of the large majority of the population on all of these issues. And it continues like that. A large majority, very large majority, thinks we should concentrate on domestic spending, about 80% for health care, similar figures for uh, education, uh, other domestic spending, and those figures have held for a long time. Uh, I should mention that these studies were barely reported in the national press, not even mentioned. Uh, so little reporting, I could actually list the newspapers where they appeared. Uh, the, uh, uh, the only uh, reasonable conclusion from this is that media, it's obviously of extreme importance right before an election. Uh, it must be, I uh, can't think of any other explanation, that media leaders uh, understand, as well as political managers, that the public must be deluded, uh, misinformed, and marginalized. Uh, the same is true on Iraq. So within a few months after the invasion, by about April 2003, a large majority of the population thought that the UN ought to take over. It ought to take, the, take responsibility for uh, economic reconstruction uh, uh, and uh, a political transition. A few months later, the same majorities held that the U UN ought to take responsibility for security in Iraq. Well, let's go back to Spain for a minute. In March 2003, Spain was very highly lauded uh, for leading uh, the marvelous new Europe uh, because uh, Osnar uh, took his orders from Crawford, Texas with the support of 2% of the population. Uh, in March 2004, it, an election came along and Osnar was voted out. 
uh, and Spain was bitterly denounced for appeasing terrorism. Uh, what was the position of the new government? Well, the position of the new government was that uh, Spain should not have troops in Iraq unless they're under a UN uh, uh, under UN authorization, which happens to be the position of about 75% of Americans at the same time. Uh, but there's a difference between Spain and the United States. In Spain, people know what public opinion is. Uh, in the United States, it takes an individual research project to determine what it is because it wasn't reported. Uh, furthermore, in Spain, they could vote on it, uh, not in the United States. Neither political party would touch such an opinion, and that's why Spain was denounced, uh, because voters took the same position as the large majority of the American public. Well, that tells us something, too. I couldn't find any comment on that. Uh, well, uh, uh, it seems to be something paradoxical about all of this. Uh, the facts of the matter, of which this is a sample, seem to conflict with the uh, grand uh, contemporary theme, uh, namely that the mission of the United States is uh, what's called democracy promotion. Uh, in particular, uh, we, the, what the liberal press calls the president's uh, messianic vision to bring democracy to Iraq. Uh, that's a vision that suddenly surfaced as the cause, the reason for the war. Uh, after all, the other pretexts for the invasion have disappeared, but uh, People were polite enough, commentators polite enough not to notice that. And in fact, there was near unanimous uh, uh, awe for the president's messianic vision. Uh, critics said, well, you know, maybe we, it's noble and inspiring, but maybe we can't carry it off uh, because of their cultural failings and so on and so forth. Actually, there was one sector of opinion, I should say, that didn't agree with this, the only one I could find, namely Iraqis. Uh, at about the same time that the president announced his messianic vision with enormous awe and acclaim, uh, I, I couldn't find a word here questioning that this was the reason for the invasion after it was announced. Uh, right at the same time, this is last November, November a year ago, uh, the Washington Post did report a poll taken in Baghdad uh, where people were asked what they thought the reason for the U.S. invasion was. And some agreed with 100% of articulate opinion here that it was to bring democracy to Iraq, 1%. Uh, 5% thought that the goal was to help Iraqis. Uh, the rest said the unspeakable here, that the goal was to take control of Iraq's resources and uh, uh, reorganize the region in the U.S. interests, the large majority. Uh, Iraqis did agree with American commentators in seeing a cultural problem, but they didn't see it in Iraq. They saw it here. It's a cultural problem here where people are willing to believe uh, the uh, word of their dear leader without any other evidence, uh, and that is a problem. They're right about that. Actually, Iraqi opinions were somewhat more nuanced. Uh, the same poll showed that about, although 1% thought that the goal of the invasion was to uh, bring democracy, about half said the United States want democracy in Iraq, but uh, the U.S. will uh, make sure that it will uh, uh, influence and determine its course. And that's correct. That's what democracy means. Democracy means you can have elections, you can do anything you like, but you better do what we say. Uh, Iraqis apparently understand that, uh, and we choose not to. And the word choose has to be emphasized because there's plenty of evidence. Well, let's go back to democracy promotion, the great contemporary theme. Uh, that's led to a huge literature. Uh, there's a whole cadre of scholarly experts now uh, on democracy promotion. The most renowned of them is Thomas Carruthers. He's the director of the Democracy and Rule of Law Project at uh, Carnegie Institution, many books and articles. Uh, he's highly supportive of this uh, leading theme of uh, U.S. foreign policy since Reagan. He just published a new book in which he... Uh, reviews the achievements of uh, the last 25 years of democracy promotion since Reagan. And the uh, intelligent man, he finds what he calls a strong line of continuity in all administrations. Namely, they're all schizophrenic. Uh, they all have split personalities, in his words, which is a very strange phenomenon. I'll give you his, his description of it. 
where supporting democracy was consistent with U.S. economic and security interests, the U.S. St stands up for democracy. Where democracy clashes with economic and security interests, democracy is downplayed and ignored, and the U.S. supports dictators and torturers. Uh, so democracy is fine, uh, but as long as uh, you follow orders, same principle as always. Actually, the uh, interesting, I'll just get in late, so I won't give more examples, but I can't, I can't uh, bear not reporting the way this is described in the business press the last few days with regard to Iraq. Now, the Wall Street Journal yesterday has an article by their Iraqi specialist uh, which says the following, in Baghdad, the men likely to lead Iraq's next government promise to demand withdrawal as soon as they take power after Sunday's election. Uh, then it says, problem in the United States. Here's the way we respond. Uh, President Bush and his aides refuse to be pinned down to such a plan. Here comes Condoleezza Rice. I'm really reluctant to try to put a timetable on that because I think the goal is to get the mission accomplished. The mission is to establish democracy by rejecting the demand of the elected leaders. Uh, and then it goes on to explain that they hope they'll be able to pressure them, pressure the democratically elected government to accept a compromise in which they will accept vague promises to withdraw rather than a firm timeline. Uh, well, Tony Blair chimed in today in the London Financial Times uh, with a long interview, also full of the great mission of bringing democracy. And uh, uh, he says, there is no way that the United States and the UK will set a timetable for the withdrawal of their troops from Iraq. A deadline is not being contemplated uh, because we must stay the course to bring them democracy. Somehow, this is all done with a straight face. Uh, don't, don't ask me how, but it's pretty impressive. Well, uh, final comment. The last election did lead to uh, a lot of uh, hopelessness here, uh, but it's important to bear in mind that the election told us essentially nothing about the country, uh, just as uh, uh, we would have learned nothing about the country if there had been a slight shift in uh, voting patterns, uh, and if the democratic imagery had been a little more uh, effective, and it had given uh, Kerry 31% of the electorate instead of giving Bush 31%, we would still have learned nothing. The reason is that there was no election in any sense of the term that is worth taking seriously. The political system, including elections, is carefully managed to prevent the threat of democracy. Uh, the uh, actual views, and that's very clear from the suppressed information that came out about people's actual views. And if you take a look at those actual views, the actual views of the public, uh, who are of course excluded from the system, uh, they provide a pretty respectable agenda for carrying forward the task of making the United States uh, a more responsible global partner. What's needed is to create, in part to recreate, a functioning democratic society in which an informed public can participate in uh, formation and implementation of policy, domestic and international, in the political sphere and the economic sphere as well. Well, that's hardly a very utopian uh, ideal, and it's not an unmanageable task uh, if we fail to undertake it successfully, we don't have anyone to blame but ourselves for what will ensue, uh, which may turn out to be very grim.